The Yakima Indian told his tale, Saluskin was his name. He led Governor Stevens boys through the mountain snowy base, and its climb up the mountain and glissar down her side. See the flowing waterfalls, her sunsets glorify. Without a doubt, the most famous guides in recorded and contemporary history of Mount Rainier are the Whitaker twins. Jim was the first American to climb Mount Everest, and Lou has led three expeditions there. The guides on Rainier are the biggest group that have summited Everest. Around 25 have done the top of Everest. When I come back, I still get goose flesh when I see the mountain. I'll fly in and see this incredible peak. This stands up higher than Mount Everest does in respect to the terrain around it. We started uh, hiking and climbing around here at the age of 12. Jim uh, guided for uh, three years on Mount Rainier, and I've guided for almost 40. He's taken blind people to the summit and uh, people with one leg. In 1981, a film crew followed Jim and Lou Whitaker as they guided the physically impaired climbers to the top. Okay, gang, you're doing it now. Right on. Uh, you your ropes when you get up here. We'll take another 10 minutes. My leg feels like raw meat. Watch spread on the rope now. Up rope. Falling, falling. Okay, Great, good. Hold on, hold on. Okay, now. Straight back up the hill. Okay, step at a time. Okay, you're on the ridge. Okay, you're the hill. You okay? Yeah, fine. Okay, okay buddy, off the ledge. The team continues the descent. Now the icefall is the only real danger before them. But the glacier has been stable since the last tragedy, and the team estimates that the chance of another avalanche is very remote. The first rope team crosses safely, but precisely as the second rope team enters the path of the icefall, the glacier cracks again. And then against all reasonable hope, before killing them all, it stops. Inexplicably, it just stops. We learn from those people how great the human spirit is, and, and uh, the mountain can help us learn that. <laughs> Lou's guide service requires a day of training before attempting the summit. We got, we got women and women guides now instead of just a bunch of macho, pseudo macho guys climbing the mountain. OK, that's too big of a step there. Bill, right? Yeah. OK. Bill, we're just going to take smaller ones. And I lock it all the way out so my hip and my knee are locked. You know, it's funny is I have almost as fun on the mountain when we don't summit. You know, because it's just about being out there with the wind and the clouds and the snow and the sun, you know. But, um, and just because people that climb are usually an incredible people. In ways, it makes a huge difference in people's lives. Personally, I haven't guided enough to have like an opinion of men and women, which gender's um, tougher, but. I thought it was interesting that one of the senior guides told me that women seem to be more resilient, so interesting, yeah. 
The first woman to climb Rainier was a teacher and journalist, Faye Fuller. In 1890, it was a challenge just to get to the mountain. The second day of travel is long. In our saddles, 14 hours. Great tall trees line the winding trail. So straight, they seem like pillars of ancient buildings. It is then one realizes the resources of this state and the dream of its future preeminence. The next morning, riding begins for several miles over rocky riverbeds. We traveled higher and higher, and at the elevation of about 4,000 feet, we entered the most beautiful parks that could be created. Saturday, August 9th. Before starting, I donned heavy flannels, woolen hose, warm mittens and goggles, drove long cocks and brads into my shoes, rolled two single blankets containing the provisions for three days. I grasped my alpenstock and resolved to climb until exhausted. After two days of toiling upwards, at 4.30 p.m., August 10th, 1890, we stood on the top. We were somewhat sheltered in the crater and examined the steam jets, looking as if a row of boiling tea kettles had been placed along the ridge. And there, with steam beside us, we spread our blankets, took off our shoes, bathed our feet in whiskey, and began the night. Wheelmen were also challenged by Mount Rainier, and back in 1898 had a running battle for bicycle paths. Did it ever strike the local road supervisors that the old method of dumping a lot of big round boulders about the size of pumpkins into the mud holes is not the modern way of making roads? They might buy a pamphlet on modern road construction and profit thereby. And it's claim of the mountain boys and Coast down her side, see the flowing waterfalls as sunsets glorify. All right, good job. I saw you coming yeah. up. Good job. Hey, anyway, we made it. All right. I just told my son he had to have to be mighty tired. Mighty tired. I am tired. I'm exhausted. Oh, yeah. That's all uphill now. All right. This is about 102 miles, according to my... 102 miles. Oh, my yeah, last. The last 20 were a killer. I <laughs> got up here. Oh, you did it. I don't know how I did it either. That was, a, that well, was an amazing you, climb. An well, amazing climb. Well, it was a little foggy. I didn't see a whole lot of mountain on the way up here. I came here with my sister and brother-in-law about 10 years ago, and I was absolutely fascinated and captivated by this mountain. Actually, at, at my desk at, at the office, I have a small postcard with a picture of Mount Rainier on it, and it, it made that much of an impression on me, and I decided I always wanted to come back. I've looked at it a couple times in the middle of a, a hectic day, thinking, boy, I'd rather be in Mount Rainier than where I am now. Maybe it's a, a, a humble feeling. You're, the, uh, the mountain is so large and beautiful, and you're so small, and it, it maybe puts things in perspective for you sort of a, a certain solitude and beauty and majesty. Perhaps the greatest challenge Rainier offers is to scientists. They're trying to predict when this active volcano will have a massive mudslide known as a lahar or a major explosion. There are 25 named glaciers on Mount Rainier. There's as much snow and ice, perennial snow and glacier ice on Mount Rainier as on all of the other Cascade volcanoes combined. So when you live downstream of that much water, 
uh, you have to recognize that, that, you, that there's a real hazard from flooding or from lahars that are initiated on the volcano. And I think every time I come here, I have to place the mountain in a, a different box. And I come here and, and hike and look at wildflowers, and I forget about the dangers of the volcano. Or I come here and work and look at the hazards, and I ignore the flowers. When magma intrudes in the volcano and destabilizes a slope, we could have a landslide occur, which would transform into a large mud flow. And these have occurred enough and perhaps without warning that we feel it's important to inform people, to educate them as to all the possibilities. To put it in perspective, there have been mud flows that have traveled as far as the Puget Sound lowlands and filled in large parts of Puget Sound. What concerns us most is that there are large populations at the base of the volcano and over 100,000 people living in areas that have been covered by lahar deposits. How likely is it that we'll have some sort of volcanic crisis here at Mount Rainier? Um, likely enough that I'm spending a portion of my career talking to people in local communities about possibilities. Mount Rainier is an active volcano. We have gases rising. There have been relatively recent eruptions as recently as the 19th century. It's not a matter of if Mount Rainier erupts, it's a matter of when.